Hello, hello, welcome. So I finally made it to this last installment. Today we're going to be finishing out Species with Amnesia, Our Forgotten History by Robert Sepper. So welcome any listeners who join us for the live and any listeners who lurk and anyone who takes a listen later on. It's some really fascinating information. Lots of big words. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, right. Dang, I ate some fried food last night. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> okay, we're into chapter six. I'm going to jump right in. Or, you know, what? well, let's see here. What's the summary of everything that we've gone through? We go through talking about uh, different fossils that had been found and then labeled as hoaxes later, even though it was never really changed in the things that they continued to say and espouse and all throughout media and textbooks. Then it goes into talking about how humans have been mud. Yes. Welcome. Ah, uh, it makes me so happy that you're here, dude. Great to see you. Uh, it always makes me so happy to see you. <laughs> so then it goes into, uh, talking about how humans are, uh, basically a uh, an amalgamation of crossbreeding between different kinds of ancient humans. And uh, juice, yes, Emily, this is Desert Rose, Zulu. Dude, you guys, welcome. Everyone, welcome. And uh, then it shows different crossbreeding natural things that happen in nature, go through a lot of the different pictures of animals and uh, things, how that has all happened. And um, then it gets into talking about the spear tips and points that they find in different areas having to do with the Cro-Magnons and where they really came from and how that links up with the timing of Atlantis, which is super fascinating. And uh, the, it addresses the out of Africa theory and it talks about our ancestral DNA. It goes into the um, RH negative blood types. Then we start talking about, um, uh, what's that guy's name? Um, well, crap, Plato, Plato. We talk about Plato's account and we talk about um, the Greek account as well. Then we uh, we're talking about the pyramids and Helena Bl Blavatsky and uh, the Jewish history into um, talking about the different stones in uh, Peru, uh, Sacsayhuaman, Cusco, Peru, and <clears throat> the pyramid structures throughout history and the Aryan language. Okay, so very brief, <laughs> very brief wind up here <laughs> into chapter six. Okay. The presence of Caucasoid haplogroups, both in ancient and recent DNA testing in South Siberia, Siberia, Mongolia, China, and South Asia is attested by the recent genetic studies and mummies from the Altai and, mm, dang, dude, <laughs> um, Xinjiang regions only seem to corroborate this fact. Others swept eastward, where for a thousand years an Aryan language, uh, Tokarian or Tokarian, was spoken in what is now Chinese Turkestan. This ancient race of Conquerors were blonde haired, blue eyed, and averaged well over six feet tall, as their ancient and perfectly preserved mummified remains clearly indicate. Some linguists have managed to link the Proto Indo Europeans to the Bronze Age and um, Andro, Androvanovo culture. Androvanovo, cool, based in Western Siberia and what is now Kazakhstan. The remains of the people themselves were buried in great mounds, like later Vikings and Anglo-Saxons, Saxon bar, um, barrows and how, house, known as Kurgans. 
Dang, I didn't know what I don't know what those words mean. Like later Viking and Anglo-Saxon barrows and howes, known as kurgans. These are similar to the ancient Native American mounds found scattered all over the Mississippi Valley. They're in Ohio too. They're all over America. I've I've visited um, three sites in Ohio. It's, it, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> okay, so now genetics have examined the DNA of these Proto-Indo-Europeans extracted from their ancient tombs. The results are revealed in three seminal papers. It turns out that genetically, the Proto-Indo-Europeans buried in the steep Kurgan graves 5,000 years ago were identical with modern Western and Northern Europeans belonging to the Nordic sub-race. The majority had light hair and blue and green eyes. It wasn't until much later that the gene complexes associated with other radical types appeared in the Central Asian steppe north of the deserts, or steep, steep north of the deserts and irrigated farming zone. The mummified remains of the Tukarian speakers is in what is now Chinese Turkestan have blonde and red hair. So incidentally, did many early pharaohs of Egypt. It is also clear from the appearance of most speakers of Indo-Aryan languages today in Pakistan, Northern India, Blackburn, and Leicester that significant in interbreeding has occurred between conquerors and conquered in the 4,000 years since. <clears throat> Genevieve, awesome, welcome. Welcome anyone and all, every, everyone rather. All right, yeah, I didn't even brush my hair. This is just, I just got out of, I stayed up really late. Okay. <clears throat> Studies carried out by scientists from the Institute of Forensic Genetics at the University of Copenhagen, Copenhagen have concluded that all blue-eyed people share a common ancestor, some who lived 6,000 to 10,000 years ago near the area near at Anatolia. Researchers analyzed and compared the unique genetic makeup of the chromosomes in the iris from 155 blue-eyed individuals from diverse regions such as Denmark, Turkey, and Jordan. All of the subjects that participated in the study had the exact same genetic, quote, mutations, unquote, in specific chromosomes of the eye with very little variation on the genes, indicating that the mutation responsible for blue eyes first arose and spread relatively recently. Scientists conclude that this blue-eyed family spread out from an area north of the Black Sea following the last ice age. Professors Hans Eiberg of the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at University of Copenhagen explains, these people were among the Proto-Indo-European Aryans who subsequently spread agriculture into Western Europe and later rode horses into Iran and India. Blue eyes are a recessive trait and the gene must be inherited from both parents. Green eyes involve a related but different gene that is recessive to brown, but dominant to blue. <clears throat> Following the ending of the last ice age, many Europeans inherited this rare gene associated with blue eyed people that differentiated them from the rest of, hum of the humanity. That includes many people who express shades of brown. They still carry the gene. Indeed, it appears that the elite and nobility that organized the earliest known agricultural civilizations all shared this trait, seemingly coming from the same bloodline. When we look to ancient Egypt, arguably one of the world's oldest known civilizations, we find many blonde and red-haired mummies. Since World War II, Western academia, backed and lobbied by politically motivated forces at the United Nations has pushed for a politically motivated, multicultural, egalitarian view of history, which has ignored ideological evidence, oh, archaeological evidence in favor of political correctness. Even if well-intentioned, this false perspective has cast much confusion over human origins, who we are and how we came to be. Scientists at Zurich-based DNA Genealogy Center, IGenia, have published that 
King Tut belonged to a specific profile group known as haplogroup R1B1A2. More than 50% of all men in Western Europe belong to this genetic group, as do up to 70% of British men. But among modern day Egyptians, less than 1% of residents belong to this haplogroup, according to scientists. King Tut and most Europeans share a common ancestor genetically who lived in the Caucasus, uh, the Caucasus region, the blue-eyed race spreading out with agriculture agriculture oh wait spreading out with agricultural after the end of the ice age the genetic the geneticists were not sure how tutankhamun's paternal lineage came from egypt from its region of origin though it is clear that technology such as chariots and domesticated horses were uh, was introduced from a foreign source okay so there's this picture on this other page king tut depicted uh, slaying Nubians, a row of hieroglyphics proclaim the perfect God, the image of the sun rising over foreign lands like Ray when he appears, crushing the vile land of Cush, uh, shooting his arrows against his enemies. Let me take this. I Let me look at it, too. Woo, it's busy. Let's check it out. Yeah, man. Wow. <clears throat> Michael, yay. Welcome. I'm glad you made it, dude. Okay. Um, all right. Another one of the oldest documented civilizations credited with having the first writing schools, courts, and many other firsts were the ancient Sumerians of Mesopotamia. The ancient Sumerians thought that blue eyes were a sign of the gods. The Sumerian nobility were blue-eyed and fair-haired, as most of their busts show. These blue-eyed statues are of Sumerians from the early 3rd millennium BC. In 1927, Arthur Keith, as quoted in Ur Excavations, or Ur, it's U-R, <clears throat> they, the Sumerians, certainly belong to the same racial division of mankind as the nations of Europe. They are scions of the Caucasian stock. Ooh. Okay, so then there's pictures here. Sumerian early dynastic period, um, circa 2900 to 2350 BC, the British Museum. Caucasoid statues. <laughs> Okay. Gautama Buddha's physical body is traditionally regarded as having the 32 characteristics of a great man. These 32 characteristics are described throughout the Pali Canon, Pali Canon, <clears throat> and are also regarded as being present in... Hmm... Kakravartan kings. Kakravartan kings. <laughs> Shoot. Kakra, Kakravartan kings. That's easier to say <laughs> as well. All right. So wait, what, is, what are they saying? These 32 characteristics are described throughout the Pali canon and are also regarded as being present in the Kakravartan kings as well. Number 29 on this ancient list is Eyes Deep Blue. Bodhidharma was a Buddhist monk who lived during the 5th and 6th century. He is credited as the transmitter of Zen Buddhism to China and regarded as its first Chinese patriarch. According to Chinese legend, he also began the physical training of the Shaolin monks that led to the creation of Shaolin Quan. The anthology of the Patriarchal Hall, considered among the oldest and most authentic Buddhist text, identifies Bodhidharma as the 28th patriarch of Buddhism in an uninterrupted line that extends all the way back to the Buddha himself. Throughout Buddhist art, he is depicted as 
profusely bearded with wide eyes and is referred as the blue-eyed barbarian in Chinese Chan texts. New archaeological finds in China are forcing an, a re-examination of old Chinese books that describe historical or legendary figures of great height, with deep-set blue or green eyes, long nose, full beards, and red or blonde hair. Scholars have traditionally scoffed at those accounts, but it now transpires that these accounts were correct. Many people are unaware of the fact that China has massive pyramids that rival Egypt in size and age. <laughs> the pyramids of China include approximately 100 ancient mounds, many of which are located within 100 kilometers of the city of Xi'an on the Qinchon Plains in the Saxony province, central China. I apologize for all my, my mispronunciations. The pyramids now can be visited on trips from Xi'an and no longer are located in forbidden zones. Several pyramids have small museums attached to them. Excuse me. So this is satellite images of two Chinese pyramids. Bam. I wish we had a... Um, something to, oh, maybe, or where can my, <laughs> that little spot right there, do you think maybe that that's that, what is it, is it Cops of Trees, or is it one of those little buildings that they were talking about? I'm just looking for point of reference, really, you know? All right. It was in these remote regions that James Churchwood, 1851 to 1936, felt he had found evidence of a lost civilization called Mu. For church word, Mu was a lost civilization and continent in the East, which he claimed was 50,000 years old and was the home of 64 million inhabitants. He claimed to have found evidence of, his, of this civilization while speaking to a number of Indian men. Though Mu stretched from Micronesia in the west to Easter Island and Hawaii in the east in the Pacific Ocean, knowledge, if not descendants of mankind's original homeland, was also meant to be found in India and surrounding regions. He believed that the primary colony of Mu was the great Uyg Uyghur Emperor, Empire. Uyghur, 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 it's U-I-G-H-U-R, empire, <laughs> and that Karakoto, cool, Karakoto, was its ancient capital, and that the civilization was at its height about 15,000 BC. Okay, church words Mu was not too difficult, was not too different from Madame Blavatsky's Lemuria, and it was the American theos, uh, theosophist Gottfried de Perucker in 1874 to 1942, who claimed that this region, this enormous tract of country, most of it desert waste, was once fertile and lush with cities. Hmm. Uh, the Taklamakan Desert, the Taklamakan Desert, that's a fun word is a large sandy desert, part of the Terran Basin, a region roughly between Tibet and Mongolia in western China, and crossed at its northern and southern edge by the Silk Road. Conditions are so harsh that travelers avoided the desert as much as possible, but in millennia gone by, the region was populated and habitable. <clears throat> China's landscape is not only limited or is not only littered with enormous pyramids, but hundreds of ancient blonde mummies with Caucasoid features. The discoveries in the late 1980s of the undisturbed 4,000 year old beauty of Laolan and the younger 3,000 year old body of the Charchin man are legendary in world archaeological circles for the fine state of their preservation and for the wealth of knowledge they bring to modern research. 
Many archaeologists now think they were the citizens of an ancient civilization of Aryans that existed in the East. Most mummies averaged above six feet tall, somewhere around six foot six tall. They had long noses and skulls, blonde or red hair, thin lips, deep set eyes, with other unmistakably Caucasian features like a ginger beard. Dr. Victor H. Mayer of the University of Pennsylvania said, the Terran Basin Caucasoid corpses are almost, are almost certainly representatives of the Indo-European family. Ancient Greek and Chinese historians had long referred to unique culture, cultural and ethnic group on its western frontier with red hair and blue eyes, a group that settled ancient Afghanistan and forged a vibrant Buddhist empire that spread Buddhism to much of the world through China and India. But when 4,000-year-old mummies were unearthed in the early 20th century in the, Tarim, in the Tarim Basin of the Western Chinese desert with Caucasoid physio, uh, ooh, physiognomy, oh no, physiognomy, physiognomy, does that mean physiology? Physiognomy, P-H-Y-S-I-O-G-N-O-M-Y, physiognomy and clothing and <laughs> and clothing of apparently aryan and celtic origin historians anthropologists and archaeologists were awestruck the tenuous ethnocultural issue made this a serious matter okay so we've got two pictures on this page before i turn turn it we've got the 4000 year old aryan mummy called beauty of laulan and then on the bottom it says left male mummy with caucasoid features and right blonde female mummy wow all right we'll start here that's the aryan mummy of laulan <clears throat> wow they look modern right <laughs> Wow, that is wild. That preservation is so good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Desert Rose. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Modern Chinese scholars refuse to believe that significant foundations of their history were imported and the modern residents of the Tarim region, uh, Zhengjian, the Uyghurs, <laughs> Uyghurs, insist that they were the original natives of the region. Now it seems that the original inhabitants were both native, as well genetically similar to Europeans, blonde, tall, etc. Even if they did not invade the territory via Europe, during the recent Holocene, having resided there since the Pliocene, the Ice Age. Oh, the Pleistocene. That T, I think I screwed that up all throughout this book. Um, the Pleistocene, all right. We know that they were horsemen and herders using chariots and may have invented the shrimp or... <laughs> They didn't invent the shrimp. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. The stirrup. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we know that they were horsemen and herders using chariots and may have invented the stirrup. <laughs> we know that we know that they had dwelled in this region by 1800 BC, that around 1200 BC, the Indo-Europeans were joined by another wave of immigrants from what is now Iran, the so-called Saka branch. In fact, the Saka nomads had high pointed hats like the ones found next to Shershen Man, Shershen Man, <laughs> as displayed on the Persepolis 
Persepolis reliefs, Persepolis reliefs in southern Iran. A bronze statue found in the Altai Mountains from the 5th century BC wore a similar hat. Most important is the fact that the statue had Caucasoid features and showed similarities in dress to Shurchen man. man, man. <laughs> the discovery of these mummies indeed rewrote history, whether some like the political implications or not. The discovery of these mummies indeed rewrote history, whether some like the political implications or not. Some appeared to have had blue eyes as shown on Chinese artwork based on the legends of the ancient gods that introduced the earliest forms of alchemy and what later became known as pre-Buddhist philosophy to the region. Uh, the Tocharians are identified as the descendants of these ancient missionaries. Ooh, okay. Some major physical evidence we have to determine whether these Buddhist missionaries were related to the mummies from the Chinese frescoes, imagery, and literature depicting what Chinese sources call the Yutzi and what Greeks called Tocharians as quite foreign in their dress, culture, and appearance. Chinese art shows pale-skinned, red-headed, blue-eyed monks with beards obviously from a race and culture very different from the modern-day Chinese. Sporting partially shaved heads, dangling, dangling earlobes, and the lotus-shaped hand posture, these white Caucasoids are obviously Buddhist monks bringing the new faith to the people along commercial and migratory routes that they had followed when they left the Tarim Basin for Afghanistan. The mummies, right, I know, I'm just like, I'm having flashbacks to my life and how Afghanistan has been related to it and then how that's probably all related to actually this. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the mummies in the small river cemetery are, so far, the oldest discovered in the Tarim Basin. Carbon tests done at Beijing University show that the oldest part dates to around 4,000 years ago. A team of Chinese geneticists have analyzed the mummy's DNA. The material lineages were predominantly East Eurasian haplogroup C with similar numbers of H and K, while the paternal lines were all West Eurasian R1A1A. So this figure 54, uh, some of the Caucasoid mummies were found with swastika artifacts. And then it says swastika, swastika artifact with Aryan mummy. Hey, is that that girl? Is that the one? I think that might be that same girl we just looked at over here. Yeah, with her braids. That's the same mummy. She's found with a swastika. I think it looks like her. Okay. <clears throat> Professor Victor Mayer at the University of Pennsylvania claims that the earliest mummies in the Terran Basin were exclusively Caucasoid or Europoid. With East Asian migrants arriving in the Eastern portions of the Terran Basin around 3,500 years ago, while the Urgher peoples arrived around the year 842, <laughs> Professor Mayer explains, claims, claimed that, oh wait, wait, Professor Mayer explains, claimed that, that's what it says. The new finds are also forcing a re-examination of old Chinese books that describe historical or legendary figures of great height with deep set blue or green eyes, long noses, full beards, and red or blonde hair. Scholars have traditionally scoffed at these accounts, but it now seems that they may be accurate. The Silk Road was an ancient caravan route that connected China to the West. The Caucasoid mummies in this part of the world might suggest that this trade route is indeed older than previously thought, very much like transoceanic contact, was taking place many millennia older than Columbus' first voyage to America. According to Dr. Han Kangzin, 
An anthropologist at the Institute of Archaeology in Beijing, the skeletal and mummified evidence clearly points to the fact that the earliest inhabitants of the Terran Basin region were people are related to the Cro-Magnons of Paleolithic Europe. And that was in quotes. Okay. <laughs> I like story time with pictures too. <laughs> okay. Woo. A new fly. All right. Areas present inhabitants or no, 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 the quotes. Okay. This theory is supported by Dr. Victor Mayer, a specialist in ancient Asian languages and cultures at the University of Pennsylvania, who uh, stimulated the major search which found the mummies. Oh, cool. Uh, he has emerged as the main advocate of the theory that large groups of Europeans were present in the Terran Basin long before the area's present inhabitants. Oh man, I gotta, I gotta cough real quick. One second. I wanna, how do I mute? Okay. I hope that's better. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Long before the present area's inhabitants. As the Chinese archaeologists dug through the five layers of burials, Dr. Mayer recounted, they came across almost 200 poles, each 13 feet tall. Many had flat blades, painted black and red, like the oars from some great galley that had founded, foundered, foundered beneath the waves and sand. At the foot of each pole, there were indeed boats laid upside down and covered with cowhide. The bodies inside the boats were still wearing the clothes they had been buried in. I mean, why wouldn't they be in that clothes? Um, they, oh, I guess, I don't know, time, predators. Okay. Um, they had felt, they had felt caps with feathers tucked in the, okay. They had felt, they had felt caps with feathers tucked in the brim. They wore large wooden capes with tassels and leather boots. Within each boat coffin were grave, grave goods, including beautifully woven grass baskets, skillfully carved, carved masks and bundles of ephedra, an herb, that may have been used in rituals or as a medicine, as well as several pounds of hemp, marijuana, and poppy, opium. Ha-ha. The language spoken by the people of the Small River Cemetery is unknown, but Dr. Mayer believes it could have been Tikarian, an ancient member of the Indo-European Aryan family language. Manuscripts written in Tokarian have been discovered in the Tarim Basin, the small river cemetery people lived more than 2,000 years before the earliest evidence of Tokarian. But there is clear con continuity of culture, Dr. Mayer said, in the form of people being buried with felt hats, the, a tradition that continued until the first few centuries AD. In her magnum opus, The Secret Doctrine, Madame Blavatsky points out in amazing clarity over a century ago in 1888, Yet the traces of an immense civilization, even in Central Asia, are still to be found. This civilization is undeniably prehistoric. And how can there be civilization without a literature in some form, without annals or chronicles? Common sense al alone ought to supplement the broken links in the history of departed nations. The gigantic unbroken wall of the mountains that hem in the whole tableland of Tibet witnessed a civilization during many millennia and would have strange secrets to tell mankind. The Eastern and Central portions of those regions, the Nat, Nat Cheyenne, sorry, and the Altin Taga, 
today known as Altintog, Altintog, hmm, were once upon a time covered with cities that could well vie with Babylon. <laughs> a, whole a whole geological period has swept over the land since those cities breathed their last. As the mounds of shifting sand and the sterile and now dead soil of the immense central plains of the basin of Tarim testify. The borderlands along the borderlands alone are superficially known to the traveler. Within those tablelands of sand, there is water, and fresh fresh oases are found blooming here, wherein no European foot has ever yet ventured or trodden the now treacherous soil. Among these verdant oases, there are some which are entirely inaccessible even to the native profane traveler. Hurricanes may tear up the sands and sweep whole plains away. They are powerless to destroy that which is beyond their reach. Build deep in the bowels of the earth. The subterranean stores are secure. And as their entrances are concealed in such oases, which is spelled differently, <laughs> there, there is little fear that anyone should discover them. The oasis of Churchen, for instance, situated about 4,000 feet above the level of the river Churchen Daria, Daria, is surrounded with the ruins of archaic towns and cities in every direction. There, some 3,000 human beings represent the relic of about 100 extinct nations and races, the very names of which are now unknown to our ethnologists. The, rep the respective descendants of all these antediluvian races and tribes known as little of their own forefathers themselves, as if they had fallen from the moon. <laughs> When questioned about the origin, they reply that they know not whence their fathers had come, but had heard that their first or earliest men were ruled by the great Genii of these deserts. The emplacement of the two cities is now covered. Owing to shifting sands and the desert wind, the strange and heterogeneous, heterogeneous, heterogeneous relics with broken china and kitchen utensils and human bones. The natives often find copper and gold kinds, melted silver, ing ingots, diamonds, and turquoises, and what is the most remarkable broken glass, coffins of some undecaying wood or material also within which beautifully preserved embalmed bodies are found. The male mummies are all extremely tall, powerfully built men with long waving hair. So that was all an excerpt from Madame Blavatsky's, uh, what's it called? The Secret Doctrine. Ha ha ha. All right. Mm. Good morning, Trace. It's so good to see you. So good to see you. Hey, welcome, Singe. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. The Terran mummies have destroyed the idea that the West and the East developed independently and that they only relatively recently made contact. The question, however, is whether Europeans went East or a Caucasoid, in quotes, Cro-Magnon group of people, perhaps native to the Terran basin, went to Europe. It may be both, since it is more than likely that we are talking about a globally linked civilization and diffusion. The Mongol leader, Temujin, uh, AD 1167 to 1227, better known by his title Genghis Khan, universal ruler, that's what Genghis Khan means, universal ruler, was, according to the Persian historian, Abu Ghassi, the tribal clan to which Genghis Khan belonged, were known as the Borchik, um, Borchikun, Borchikun, which means gray-eyed men, Borchikun. 
here's a little picture of Genghis Khan. It says conqueror. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Temujin himself was noted in Chinese descriptions of him for his tall stature, stature and heavy beard. We should also note the following depiction of Temujin's appearance as given by Harold Lamb in his biography of the great Khan. He must have been tall with high shoulders, his skin a whitish tan, his eyes set far apart under his sloping forehead did not slant, and his eyes were green or blue-gray in the iris, with black pupils, long reddish-brown hair, fell in braids to his back. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Abul Ghassi also observed that the family of Yasugai, Yasugai, the father of Temujin, were known for the fact that their children often had fair complexions and blue or gray eyes. Temujin's wife, Burtai, bore a name which means gray-eyed. Temujin's relatives and descendants also possessed fair features. Temujin's son and successor, Agade, had gray eyes and red hair. Temujin's grandson, Mangu, had reddish eyebrows, and a red-brown beard. Subate, who conquered China, had a long reddish beard. Indeed, it was said that people were surprised. Kublai Khan, oh, oh wait, Kublai Khan were surprised. Kublai Khan had dark hair and eyes because most of Genghis Khan's descendants had reddish hair and blue eyes. Narrated in the book of, Gen of Genesis, <laughs> In the narrated in the book of Genesis, in the Old Testament, Noah's Ark is said to have rested on the mountains of Arat. Some of the nobility of an antediluvian civilization, possibly Atlanteans, may have settled in the Mount Arat, East Anatolia region, near the countries now known as Armenia and Northern Iran. They then moved eastward to India, Pakistan, etc., and westward to Central, North, and Western Europe, teaching their language, Proto-European, oh, Proto-Indo-European slash Iranian or Aryan, technology in the use of the wheel, domesticated animals and ag agriculture, etc., and intermixing with the peoples living in those regions. Like Northern India, Germany also was peopled by the Aryans, it should not be thought that Sanskrit is the root, but rather it is but one of the branches of the Aryan world tree, which was derived from Proto-Aryan, like the Germanic languages. Therefore, it shares a common origin and is of the same age as the Germanic languages in which old Aryan still lives. Wherever the Aryans went, the astrotheological solar-based mis solar mysteries went with them and appeared in the course of time, after their origin was forgotten as the groundwork of religions, epic poems, folklore, and nursery tales. Cool. <laughs> All right, so um, there's a picture up here, and it's showing that this darker center here, it says the extent of the Indo-European language family prior to the great expansion. And then this uh, lighter area, it's the great Indo-European expansion circa 2000 to 1000 BC. And then there's a bunch of little squiggly lines showing where people traveled to and from. <clears throat> Almost all that we have of legend comes to us from these ancient Aryan forefathers, sometimes scarcely changed, sometimes so altered that the links between the old and new have to be puzzled out. But all these myths and traditions, when we come to know the meaning of them, take us back to a time when the Aryans dwelt together in the high lands of Central Asia. This Aryan expansion included their seafaring branch the Phoenicians. 
they were a technologically advanced people who have been marginalized by official history, and this has obscured their true identity. They are fundamental to understanding where agricultural civilizations emerge and what factors contribute to their degradation or downfall. It was they who brought both their genetic lines and their knowledge to Europe, Scandinavia, and the Armenian thousands of years BC. All right, we're getting into chapter seven. Oh, and I think it's like the last chapter. It doesn't even look long. I think most of these are references. Holy cremoles. It's going to be a short one, y'all. <laughs> oh, don't lose the page. Eee! <laughs> I did. Okay, found it. All right. Chapter seven. We can trace the evolution and spread of the solar-based mysteries and how they became the backbone of all pagan religions. From the, from the Caucasus Mountains region, which moved into the Indus Valley of India and created what is today known as the Hindu region. It was these same Aryan invasions which introduced the ancient Sanskrit language to India and the stories and myths contained in the Hindu holy books, the Vedas. Waddell's research into ancient civilizations established that the father of the first historical Aryan king of India, recorded in the Mahabharata epic and Indian Buddhist history, was the last historical king of the Hittites in Asia Minor. The Indian Aryans worshipped the sun as the father god Indra, and the Hittite Phoenicians called their father god Bel by the name Indara. Under many names, these same Aryan people also settled in Sumer, Babylon, Egypt, and Asia Minor, now Turkey, and others, taking with them the same stories, myths, and mystery solar religion. <clears throat> Ooh, my hand just went numb. This is why all the major religions tell the same tale, but using different names. They all come from the same source, this Aryan diffusion during the current Holocene. So this is a picture of Robert, Robert Seffer, the author of this book. And um, he's gazing at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, these hieroglyphs. I think that's Rob. Oh yeah. It says it right there. <laughs> it looks like him. Okay. Teutonic peoples, which come from a term Teutons. Oh, is it Tetons? T-E-U? Teutonic or Teutonic? Teutons, which is a Latinized form of the word, meaning the people of Germanic origin in general. However, it also refers to the languages spoken by other peoples, including the Gothic, Anglo-Saxon, English, Dutch, Icelandic, Norse, Danish, German, and Swedish. The Sumerians, not Sumerians, but Cimmerians, C-I-M-M-E-R-I-A-N-S, the Cimmerians migrated northwest from the Caucasus, and Asia Minor, Turkey, into the countries we now call Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, and Denmark. See, that's why we got all those other really awesome ancient stories like the Oralinda and the Bach Saga. Okay. The, the Roman historians, Pliny and Tacitus, said that all the people along the coast from the Netherlands to Denmark were the same ethnic group, and this is supported by archaeological evidence, which indicates that this people arrived in that region about 300 to 250 BC. Another group traveled up to the river Dan Danube, the Blue Danube, okay, through Hungary and Austria, Hungary and Austria, into southern Germany and France. The Romans called them Gauls, and the Greeks knew them as the Celts. That's me. <laughs> All right. The Scythians, another Aryan group, also moved north from the Caucasus into Europe, 
where their name was changed by the Romans to distinguish between them and other peoples. The secret emblems of the Scythians included the serpent, the ox, Taurus, fire or flame, sun, and tho or Theo, the god the Egyptians called Pan. The Romans called <clears throat> the Romans called the Scythians the Sarmate and the Germani from the Latin word Germanus, meaning genuine. Another group of Aryan Scythians who became known as the Sakas went east from the Caucasus following the trail of the earlier Aryans, and they reached the borders of China by 175 BC. About this time, Chinese records tell of a people called the Sa Wang or Sak Wang, who were forced to flee India. Sak Wang means Saka princes. Saka princes. Oh, okay. Saka people. Okay. These record records indicate that these Saka retreated south into India through the mountain passes from Afghanistan. And coins dating from about 100 BC confirmed that a Saka kingdom was created in the upper Indus valleys between Kashmir and Afghanistan. Again, it is not a coincidence that the region of Buddhism emerged from lands occupied by the Saka, Aryan Scythians. At least by 500 BC, a tribe called the Sakyas lived in in the area where Buddha is supposed to have been born around 63 years earlier. Gwat, uh, Gautama Buddha was called Sakyashina or Sakamuni, the Saka sage, Sakya, the teacher, and the lion of the tribe of Sakya. Sarah Elizabeth, Sarah Elizabeth Titcomb, and in Aryan sun myths, the origin regions. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me try that again. He's setting us up for a little blurb that this Sarah girl said. Sarah Elizabeth Titcomb in Aryan Sun Myths, The Origin of Religion says that in ancient times, there lived a noble race of men called the Aryans, speaking a language not yet Sanskrit, Greek, or German, but continuing the dialects of all. This clan, which had advanced to a state of agricultural civilization, had recognized the bonds of blood and sanctioned the bonds of marriage. Um, that they worshipped nature, the sun, moon, sky, and earth. Their chief object of adoration was the sun. Almost all that we have of legend comes to us from our Aryan forefathers, sometimes sacredly changed, or sometimes scarcely changed, sometimes so altered that the links between the old and new have to be puzzled out. But all these myths and traditions, when we come to know the meaning of them, take us back to a time, to the time when the Aryan dwelt together in the high lands of Central Asia. Irish occult historian Michael mm, Ser Serian agrees that the Aryan legacy is very ancient and likely antediluvian, pointing to their influence in all parts of the world, saying, Aryan can be Jew or Gentile, Saxon or Hindu, Celt or Egyptian, Oriental or Nordic, Maya or Maori. Originally, the Aryans were the technically and spiritually endowed seers, sages, or elders of Atlantis, and the other lost civilizations that flourished and then fell over 10,000 years ago. These early Aryans worshiped the elements of nature, the moon, the sky, earth, and above all, the sun, the ultimate metaphor for divine light. Woo! To these people, in the infancy of their newly emerging post-cataclysmic civilization, the sun was not a mere spiritual luminary. Oh, yeah, was not a mere spiritual luminary, but a creator, ruler, and savior of their world as they knew it. As there could be no life or vegetation without light, the sun, as 
a light bringer, literally Lucifer, became for these people their creator. In driving away the darkness, likewise in fertilizing the earth, the sun became for them the, pers uh, the preserver slash protector or savior of mankind and all living things. As the sun sometimes scorches and withers vegetation and dries up the rivers, this same sun was conceived of also as a destroyer. In this context of creator, preserver, and destroyer, the sun can be seen as a trinity. Sounds like Kali too. Oh, this is a 32,000 year old mammoth ivory sculpture found in 1939 in Germany. Wow. I wonder what it is. Is it a bear? Is it a bear man? Is it a lion man? Okay. <clears throat> so the sun can be seen as the Trinity. It is to these Vedic hymns written, or Vedic, Vedic, yeah, Vedic hymns written. It is said from 1000 to 1500 years before the Christian era that we must go for the development which changes the sun from a mere luminary to a supreme being. These hymns contain the germ story of the virgin born God and savior, the great benefactor of mankind who is fully put to death and rises again to life and immortality on the third day. In the, scans, in the Sanskrit dictionary compiled more than 2000 years ago, we find a full account of the incarnate deity Vish, Vishnu. Hey, who appeared in human form as Krishna. Vishnu being moved to relieve the earth of her load of misery and sin came down from heaven and was born of the virgin um, Devaki, Devaki on the 25th of December. <laughs> For centuries after the time assigned as the birth of Jesus, he was not represented as a man on the cross. The earlier representation, representation of him was as a lamb. This custom continued until the pontificate of Agathon during the region of Constant, Constantine Poganathus, Poganathus. By the sixth synod, of Constantinople. Wow, I have, there's a lot of words. Okay. It was ordained that instead of the ancient symbol, which had been the lamb, the figure of a man nailed to a cross should be represented. All this was confirmed by Pope Adrian I. When discussing nations who are comprehended under the common appellation of Indo-European, Max Muller says, the Hindus, the Persians, the Celts, Germans, Romans, Greeks, and Slavs do not only share the same words and the same grammar, slightly modified in each century, but they seem to have likewise preserved a mass of popular traditions which had grown up before they left their common home. The solar mysteries, oh, oh, right, there's a picture up here too of the swastika, and then we've got um, the Star of David. Or is that, is that, it doesn't even say any of that stuff, but that's what those are. We can do it. <laughs> cool. Um, oh yeah, so I'm at the top of this page. One, three, one. Okay. The solar mysteries, as have been mentioned, went with the Aryans when they peopled Persia. Ooh, which is thought to be where maybe tarot card came from. And became the religion of the ancient Pharisees. 
Mithras was the name which the Persians gave to the sun, Mithras. Um, after ages had passed, it was utterly forgotten that Mithras was the sun, and it was believed that he was the only begotten son of God, who had come down from heaven to be a mediator between God and man, to save men from their sins. The 25th of December was said to be a day on which this God-man was born, and it was celebrated with great rejoicings. If we turn to the Egyptians, we find that the Aryan sun myth became the foundation of their religion also. One of, the, one of their names for the sun was Osiris. The facts relating to the incarnation, birth, life, and death of Osiris are very similar to those in the legends of the Hindu and Persian sun gods. The sun, moon, and five planets were each of them assigned a day of the week the seventh day being Saturn's day and kept as a holy day. The immortality of the soul was believed in, was believed in and was a very ancient doctrine. Horus, another Egyptian name for the sun, <laughs> was said to have been born of the immaculate virgin Isis, the moon, on the 25th of December, right? The cusp of prophecy. Um, <clears throat> that's the week of the cusp of prophecy. Okay. Uh, the ancient Egyptians had the legend of the tree of life, the fruit of which enabled those who ate it, ate of it to become as gods. Hmm. This stuff is so fascinating. All right. The ancient Greeks had a tradition of the islands of the blessed the Elysium on the borders of the earth abounding in every charm of life and the garden of Hesperides, Hesperides in the paradise in which grew a tree bearing the golden apples of immortality. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the story. All right. It was guarded by three nymphs and a serpent or dragon. <laughs> It was one of the labors of Hercules to gather some of those apples of life. Ancient medallions represent a tree with a serpent twined around it. The Greeks, who are Aryans, called themselves the Hellenes, which means shining ones. Hellenistic, hell, welcome to hell, which is heaven, really, you know? <laughs> All right. I mean, according to some other books and stuff, but yeah. Um, and traced their descendants from the people who were destroyed by the flood, as did their tribes. The Chinese have a legend of the sun standing still and a legend of the deluge. Accounts of the ascent to heavens of holy men without death are found in their mythology. They believe that in the latter days, there will be a millennium and that the divine man will establish himself on earth and everywhere restore peace and happiness. From time immemorial, the Chinese have worshiped the virgin mother and child. The mother is called Shin Mu or the Holy Mother and is represented with rays of glory surrounding her head. <laughs> Tappers are kept constantly burning before her images which are elevated in alcoves behind the altar altars of their temples. The Mexican sun god or savior, Quetzalcoatl, born in the land of Tulin in Anahuac, <laughs> was the son of Tez, Tezcatl, Tezcatlipoca, Tezcatlipoca, the supreme god of the ancient Mexicans and the virgin Sakaketzel, Sakaketzel, who was worshiped as the virgin mother, the queen of heaven. The ancient Mexicans had a tradition of the deluge from which a person corresponding to Noah was saved with six others in an ark, which landed on a mountain, a bird being sent out to ascertain when the waters had subsided. Ha <laughs> ha. They also had a legend of the building of a tower, 
which would reach to the skies, their object being to see what was going on in heaven. Ooh, like the trees. Um, and also to have a place of refuge in case of another deluge. Right. The gods beheld with wrath this edifice, the top of which was nearing the clouds, and they hurtled fire from heaven upon it, which drew it down and killed many of the workmen. The work was then discontinued as each family interested in the building of the tower received a language of its own and the builders could not understand each other. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> we're almost here. We're almost to chapter eight here. I'm just, this stuff is blowing my mind. I don't remember this. I don't remember reading this stuff. Okay. The Scandinavians worshipped a triune god, a trinity, and consecrated one day in the week to him. The day being called to the present time Odin's or Woden's day, which is our Wednesday. They observed the rite of baptism. They had a legend of an Eden or golden age, which lasted until the arrival of of women out of Jotunheim, 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 the region of giants, Jotunheim. That's why I'm Jotunheim. Oh, I'm, yeah, okay. Yggdrasil and all that. Okay. Um, the ancient Germans worshiped a virgin mother and child. The virgin name, the virgin's name was Ostara. Hey, Ostara. That's the, that's the fall equinox. That's what we just did. Astara. Or Eoster. Whence comes our Easter? Oh, weird. Am I thinking of that wrong? Is Easter actually, I don't know. I thought Astara was the fall equinox, but if it's saying that this has to do with April, maybe, maybe Astara is the spring. What's Beltane? All right. All right. Um, in ancient times, this festival was preceded by a week's indulgence of all kinds of sports called the Carnival. The worship of the constellation Aries was the worship of the sun in his passage through that sign. And the age was called Arian. This constellation was called by the ancients, the lamb or the ram. <laughs> ah, I'm Aries. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm Aries Taurus. This constellation was called by the, okay, wait, wait. On an ancient metal of the Phoenicians brought by Dr. Clark from Sidium, the, and described <laughs> and described in his travels volume, this Lamb of God is described with the cross and rosary. In Phoenix, the Phoenix, the mythical bird of Egypt, was in fact the sunbird of the Phoenicians, the emblem of the sun god, Bill or Bell, and, that it has, and as it has been later symbolized, a peacock or an eagle. Wow, sometimes when I'm meditating and I'm like meditating about the tree of life, which I see like from this wellspring, like the first river. Sometimes I imagine that there's a phoenix in the branches of it. Phoenician, right? The red, that the red people. Isn't that what Phoenician means red, right? Moo Moo! Hey, oh my gosh, Faith! Yes, welcome! We're almost to the end here. We're just to chapter eight. And that's the end. It's only like five or six pages left, y'alls. Okay. Chapter eight. Ancient people of various cultures from all over the world seemed to all be very heavily. Let me try again. I'm struggling. Let me try again. Okay. 
Ancient peoples of various cultures from all over the world seem to all be very heavily involved in various systems of divination. Whether it be throwing bones, looking at the entrails of animals, gazing into the clouds of smoke, the I Ching, reading coffee, tarot cards, astrology, etc., all seem to involve a unique way of linking the human mind or consciousness with the very nature of time itself in order to understand cycles of nature and predict the future. <laughs> oh my God, this is so cool. All right. Although they were often overlooked, calendars constitute one of the most important cultural artifacts of human creation. Not only do they order our lives, which is in itself the extremely important function that allows for life on earth to proceed with regularity, but the study of the history of calendars also reveals the similar zodiacal I hate, I hate saying that word, zodiacal and common sacred numerical, numerical natural cycles interwoven into the occult mysteries of many world religions and shamanic activities. Ooh, this is already my favorite chapter. <laughs> I love all the chapters. Okay. Astrotheology is most commonly defined as the study of astronomical influences recorded in religion, implying that religion consists of various astronomical allegories. Astrotheology also represents the observation and reverence of natural cycles and phenomena, including celestial bodies such as the sun, moon, planets, stars, constellations, and their greater potential influence or relevance in our life. Relevance in our life. Broadly speaking, however, we can incorporate general nature worship into the def definition as well, right? Because when you do that, I think you're just like led that way, right? I mean, like, that's what happened to me, but um, such, a, uh, such that astro theology could be used to describe the ancient global region as a whole, <laughs> which also personified perceived spirits in elements such as wind, water, fire, and earth as well as anthropomorphizing animals, such as the crocodile in Egypt or the monkey in India. Of course, the main occult attraction that takes center stage in the subject of astrology is the veneration of light and its greatest symbolic representative, the sun. In the words of researcher and author Jordan Maxwell, man's first eminent Man's first enemy was darkness. Understanding this one fact alone, people can readily see why the greatest and most trustworthy friend the human race could ever have was by far heaven's greatest gift to the world, the glorious rising orb of day, the sun. Hey, Mama. Welcome. Animals 2. Hey, look, Animals 2. Animals, too, are affected by the sun as well as the moon, hence the reverence of these celestial bodies and elements they represent and, uh, as expressed in numerous sacred celebrations in, is included in the deeper understandings of astrotheology. This, in addition to the many ancient stone structures all over the world, always aligned to the solstices and equinoxes. Woo! That's this week. Roughly 12,000 years ago, at the close of the last ice age, a late Magdalenian tribe settled in Southeast Anatolia and built a calendar sanctuary now known as Gobekli Tepe. Ooh, right, I wanna go to Gobekli, I wanna go there. <laughs> go, I said it right the first time, Gobekli Tepe. In what is now modern day Turkey, Ooh, right. I want to go to that under, I want, there's so many things in Turkey. There's so many things around here too. All right. The oldest known humanoid statue ever discovered at 12,000 years old, referred to as Urfa Man, was also found in the region of Gobekli Tepe, similar to the blue-eyed statues of ancient Egypt and Sumer. It had dark blue obsidian crystal 
crystal used for the eyes. Oh, I know. I remember what that guy looks like. Um, over 5,500 years before the first cities of Mesopotamia and 7,000 years before the Circle of Stonehenge, Massive T-shaped stone towers were erected and carved with drawings of lions, scorpions, boars, foxes, and other animals. Of the many animals depicted at Gobekli Tepe, the most common species seen is that a snake and representations of it have also been found at other sites. Oh, here's a picture of Gobekli Tepe. I'm trying to remember of the name of that um, underground civilization that that guy found under his house too in Turkey. What was that one called? Um, ah, it's not coming to me right now. Those are the T-shaped structures. Where's my finger? That's one of those T's. They're right here. Which they think represent like a human, or at least from some of the reading I've done. Oh yeah, what is that underground whole civilization they found in Turkey called? Like, ah, so I mean that's so. If you guys remember it, <laughs> throw it out there, please. <laughs> okay. Um, in the center stood what some archaeologists have interpreted as a tree of life. Around it, large twelve poles, and a zodiac of twelve animals. That symbolized the solar year of a dozen months of 30 days each, a total of 360. We can see the same calendar division of 360 for the solar year used by the Egyptians and Aztec. So um, this is the Egyptians and Aztec down here. The Egyptians, uh, um, um, Omphilus, Omphilus divided into 36 sections or deacons. Ooh like the Zodiac. Um, right, the Aztec calendar wheel. Outer rim is also divided into 36 sections plus four on each on the inner arms, totaling 52. Okie doggy. Ooh, cool, cool. <clears throat> All right. Based on my own research and the conclusions of other working in the field, others working in the field, it has become exceedingly clear to me that Paleolithic people, specifically those descended from Cro-Magnon, had been aware of and continuously tracked the astronomical phenomenon known as the precession of the equinox since at least the last ice age. <laughs> In 1894, the Indian astronomer Sri um, Yuksawar, 1855 to 1936, wrote that the cause of the cycle known as precession or the precession of the equinox was a result of our sun's orbit around another star. He estimated the orbit period at 24,000 years. This long cycle is the same concept as Plato's great year, as well as the Maya long court calendar. So this is the Maya long court cal calendar. Dang, it's gorgeous. The Maya used three different calendars. The first was the sacred calendar or Zulkan, which lasted 260 days and then started over again, just as our 365 day calendar refreshes once it hits December 31st. This calendar was important for activities involving agriculture and scheduling religious ceremonies. The second calendar was the Hob, or secular calendar, which lasted 365 days. The fi final calendar was the long count calendar, which included dates written out as five hieroglyphs separated by four periods, 
and recently completed a major cycle, December 21, 2012. In our calendar marked the end of the 13th Baktun of the Mayan Long Count calendar. This reverence for the sorry, this reverence for the cyclical aspects in nature and time cross, especially in the context. Again, reference for the also present when considering the context of the four cardinal points, which are of great importance in esoteric astrology and astrotheology. This understanding is the evidence behind the symbol most famously referred to as the swastika. Although often considered to have originated in India, the ancient symbol and its meaning was brought into India with the Aryans and predates written Sanskrit itself, which was also introduced to India. In fact, these same Aryans introduced the horse and chariot to India, which are mentioned in the ancient Aryan epics of India. The Aryan invasion theory has become politically incorrect in recent years as egalitarianism is, print, is painted over a colonialist history. That said, the caste system, which is still visible in India today, was imposed by those same Aryans, which, accord to some Indian nationalists, are fabricated stories of people who never invaded. One of the interpretations of the swastika is as an emblem of the solar year, as well as Plato's great year, which is also known as the procession of the equinox. The ancient Greeks associated the swastika symbol with the sun god, Apollo, Apollo, exemplifying the symbol's historic and universal use as a solar emblem. So um, the I'll finish this last one and then I'll show. The fixed cross consisting of the four constellations has the same four signs regarded in the Christian belief as the four living creatures of the prophet Ezekiel. These four had the face of man, Aquarius, the body of a lion, Leo, the horns of an ox, Taurus, and the wings of an eagle, eagle Scorpio. The eagle, identically, was astrologically interchangeable with Scorpio. All right, so over here we have this... Um, figure what is this showing us okay well we have well it's not even the it's not even 22 jewish letters but we have oh oh they're the jewish shines for the zodiac here bad ass we've got other depictions of like the cross in the four points and the swastika aztec you know i'll actually be able to read it better up in this thing It'll be bigger than my eyes, bigger, bigger than it is. Maybe. Can I, can I see that? Aztec, Greek, Hindu, Celt. Mm, uh, Hopi, China. Japan. Hmm. I don't know about that second to last one, but the last one is Turkey, I think. These things are all connected. Plus, the basic symbolism of a cross is male and female intersecting and duality balance. The structures, the four points, structure, building, from the ether to the physical. Okay, <clears throat> then the next page, we have this picture. The face of a man, Aquarius, the body of a lion, Leo, uh, the horns of an ox, Taurus, 
the wings of an eagle, Scorpio. That's Robert Sepper too. Man, it'd be so cool to travel with him. Whew, I like his mind. Okay, then we have the human Aquarius. We've got the lion, the Leo, the bull, the Taurus, the eagle. And this other culture's art. All these things depicted here. Yeah, those things they told us in school, man. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> it's so lame. <laughs> oh. Hey, all things for their own reasons, even if it wasn't to learn anything about what might have transpired. <laughs> all right. These same four fixed signs of the Zodiac are symbolized by the four evangelists and in the four beasts of Revelation... Keep in mind that Scorpio has not just two symbols, but three. The scorpion, the eagle, and the phoenix. Ooh. Oh, cool. I hope you listen to this code. Okay, this last picture here we have. The Worship of the Golden Calf by Filipino Lippi, 1457 to 1504. And then over we have another painting, Moses Breaking the Tablets of the Law. Oh, those words are so small. And I have really good vision. He saw the calf and the dancing and Moses's anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and broke them beneath the mountain. When Moses was said to have descended from the mountain with the Ten Commandments in the 17th, 13th century BC, at the end of the age of Taurus, some of his people or followers were found by him to be worshiping a golden bull calf. He instructed those worshipers to be killed. This represents Moses killing the bull and the age of Taurus, the, un, uh, the ushering in the age of Aries, which he represented in his, which, he, okay, which he represented when he is depicted with ram horns. So I just got to feel like every time we come into a new age, we're just into the age of Aquarius. It's, it's like, we are building a program right now, you know? Okay. We're building the new program. What are the stories that are we going to get told around? I mean, are we going to be living our life from our authentic nature as sovereign beings or what? Are we going to just be like, oh, they told me it was a good idea to do this. So I just did, which it's great to be a pack animal and it's great to be a part of the crowd. Right. And to be loved. But at what cost? Let's build it good. That's what I'm saying. We're building right now. <laughs> okay. So. This is the same scenario when Mithras, as the solar hero deity, ends the Taurian age by killing the bull, ushering in the Aryan age. This ancient ritual is still played out with bullfighting today. And the reason why the bullfighter with the red solar cape, bulls are colorblind to red, traditionally ends up killing the bull in the end. Ooh, I got a tickle on my nose. All right, white marble relief with Mithras slaying the bull. Another art representation of how our lives are ruled by the zodiac and the stars around us. <laughs> I mean, you don't ha you don't have to be in that flow, right? But I'm just saying, if you want to be, it's so cool. In Egypt. And the civilizations of the Americas, we find the worship of the worship of the sun god. In Egypt, the sun god was called Ra. In oh, the the Toltec of Mexico called their sun god Rana, and the Peruvian sun god was Remi. Carl G. Jung said, "The sun is actually the only reasonable symbol for God." 
The sun is the father God who gives life to all appearances, the creator of all living things, the energy source of our world. But there's also balance within that, right? The light and the dark, the moon too. The Egyptian legends refer to a time when the sun was completely obscured in dense clouds. The ancient Egyptians also relate to ages of fire and ice and the victory of the sun god over the evil one. During a time of fire and ice, there is also mention of a cave life, a time when people lived in mountain caves to escape the devastations. Oh, Darren Kuyu. That's what that place in Turkey is called, Darren Kuyu. Maybe that's where those people escape to. I want to visit Darren Kuyu so much. What do they say? It goes down like 30, la 30 levels into the ground. They, you know, had breweries. They had, they had agriculture. They had horses and honey. They had all of these air pipes up. It, Darren Kuyu in Turkey, that underground place. Um, yeah, they said, at least the interwebs, some, some guy just found it in his basement. Who knows, you know? Where am I? <laughs> Egyptian priests, is that what I'm about to talk about? Mm, energy source of our world. Son of a gun. Oh, Egyptians. Caves to escape the devastation. Yeah, that's why Darren Kuyu came to me. Okay. Most of all, the civilizations in South and Central America and Egypt preserved a tradition of the deluge, the flood. As we often see in flood mythology, there is the transfer of the Atlantis legend by the Atlantean people to a high mountain in their new home. The Timaeus. Oh, in Timaeus, uh, Plato recounts the tale told from the Egyptian priests. They have been and will be again. There have been and will be again many destructions of mankind arising out of many causes. The greatest have been brought about by the agencies of fire and water, and other lesser ones by innumerable other causes. There is a story which even you have preserved preserved that once upon a time uh ee, Phaethon, Phaethon, uh Phaethon, the son of Helios having yoked the seeds in his father's chariot because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father burnt all that was upon the earth and was himself destroyed by the thunderbolt now this has the form of a myth but really signifies a declination of the bodies moving in the heavens around the earth and a great conflagration of things upon the earth, which recurs after long intervals. <laughs> the cycles. The Egyptian priests via Plato point out that the ancient myth clearly refers to celestial events and the perceived alterations that come about when changes happen at regular periodic intervals. It is explained to Solon. Ah, I couldn't remember that name earlier. Solon, the Greek statesman that his people lack records of these events because they were so devastated that even language and writing itself can be lost. The priest continues. Whereas just when you and other nations are beginning to be provided with letters and the others, the other requisites of civilized life, after the usual interval, the steam from heavens, like a pestilence, comes pouring down and leaves only those of you who are destitute of letters and education. And so you have to begin all over again, like children, and know nothing of what happened in ancient times, either among us or among yourselves. In the first place, you remember a single deluge only, but there were many previous ones. In the next place, you do not know that there formerly dwelt in your land the fairest and noblest race of men which ever lived, and that you and your whole city are descended from a small seed or remnant of them which survived. 
And this was unknown to you because for many generations, the survivors of that destruction died, leaving you no written word. So good. See, that's why today with all, as far as we've come with all this, it's just like, it's inside of us. It always was inside of us. All right. What celestial bodies could influence cataclysmic events on earth? NASA scientists are searching for an invisible death star that is hypothesized to circle our sun and periodically catapult potentially catastrophic comets at the earth. NASA. <laughs> NASA. Okay. Okay, NASA. Um, the theoretical star, also known to astronomers as Nemesis, is expected to exceed five times the size of Jupiter and could be to blame for the impact that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Dinosaurs. Okay. The bombardment of celestial missiles is being blamed by some scientists for mass extinctions of life, and they say happen periodically on Earth. Some scientists believe that Nemesis is a red or brown dwarf, a failed star. <laughs> Isn't that a show? The red dwarf star or something like that? Okay. Um, that has not managed to generate enough energy to burn like the sun. It may eventually be detectable by the super heat sensitive space telescope called WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. But so far, nothing has been officially admitted to the public. I'm sure that's what that device was made for. Okay. Um, our solar system is thought to be surrounded by a vast sphere of distant bodies called the Oort cloud. Some of this space debris may get kicked in towards the inner planets as comets, giant snowballs of ice, dust, and rock. The suggestion is that the Death Star's massive gravitational influence is to blame. Paleontologists David Raup and Jack Sepkowski discovered that over the last 250 million years, life on Earth has been devastated on a fairly regular and predictable cycle. Comet impacts are suggested as a likely cause for these periodic global catastrophes. Most stars have one or more companion stars orbiting around each other, which would make the sun's single status unusual. A major clue to Nemesis's existence is a mysterious dwarf planet called Sedna that was spotted on an elongated 12,000 year long orbit around the sun. Mike Brown, who discovered Sedna said, Sedna is a very odd object. It shouldn't be there. It never comes anywhere close to any of the giant planets or the sun. It's way, way out there on this incredibly eccentric orbit. The only way to get on an eccentric orbit is to have some giant body kick you. So what is out there? Right. And maybe we're just approaching that, these questions from like the wrong angle. <laughs> we're like, what is in here? And like when something fires in our brain, like maybe that's that star was just like shining a little brighter up there. Like how connected is it? Professor John Matisse of the University of Louisiana says most comets in the inner solar system seem to come from the same region of the Oort cloud launched by the pull of a companion star to the sun that scatters comets in its wake. He suggests it is up to five times the size of Jupiter, adding that there is statistically significant evidence that this concentration of comets, comets could be caused by a companion to the sun. Hmm. Whatever the cause of these periodic cataclysms on Earth, it is clear, it is clear is that 
I think it's supposed to say what is clear. What is clear is that there was a massive event that separates the Pleistocene Ice Age from the current Holocene age roughly 11,500 years ago. Rapidly melting ice caps caused a global rise in sea levels, submerging islands and coastal communities worldwide. Once we confront this, we may discover our historic cradle of civilization was never out of Africa, but out of Atlantis. The end. <laughs> Dr. E, awesome. Oh my gosh. So some pretty fascinating info in there, right? I implore you to go check out Robert Sepper's uh, website as well. Plus he has many other books. Um, yes, Gods with Amnesia. Maybe we'll read that one too sometime, but I'm not sure. I think I might, I might, I keep saying I'm going to read a new book in here. But I don't know. There seems to be so many books that I want to share. And I think that I might have to read that DMT, the spirit molecule next. It's so good, right? Um, Heidi, yes! I'm so glad that you're here too. So we made it. We did it. We got through this other book. And man, I'm starting to find some other flows in my life so I can see how I can make this up. Because I don't want to stop doing this. I love doing this. It feels so good. Ooh, also I'll just do a, I'll do a plug. If you guys... Um, if you don't already know, I got all the 12 Zodiac signs for your um, fall equinox readings. You're welcome to go check it out. There's a link in the description to Ali Cat Arcana. Oh, hey, look, I, I had my name up there as Ali Cat Arcana the whole time. Cool. Um, so, hey, thanks for being with me. And, uh, you know, like some of that was kind of rough, right, <laughs> for me to get through. <laughs> I hope you understood it. <laughs> I love you guys. Thanks for being here. And, um. I'm not sure when the next book I'm going to start into, but I think it's going to be next week. And then we'll just find out then what I get into. Who knows? Maybe I'll change my mind until then. But yeah, thanks so much. I'll see you so soon. Hopefully tonight in someone's stream. <laughs>